let me know. Oh, okay. Welcome uh, everybody to this meeting of Soteria, where we have for the second time Dr. Hewitt Wilkinson, so probably known to most of you. He is a fellow of the United Kingdom Council for Psychotherapy and has written a lot of papers on the subject of psychotherapy and in the journal, International Journal of Psychotherapy. He's also vice chairman of the Devere Society, and his first talk was on the subject of the Shakespeare authorship question. Today, he is speaking on the subject of Platonism in literature, though I think it would be um, more appropriate if he gave himself a proper description of how he's approaching that difficult subject. The title is Platonism in mainly English literature since the Renaissance. And I just quote, in case people didn't receive my mail, uh, that he wrote, while there are significant specific authors influenced by Platonism, J.C. Powers and E.M. Foster to name two British examples, he will be focusing mainly on a more fundamental influence which is connected with the modern concept of individuation, which my way of thinking, but I'm not a philosopher, would be the contrary of Platonism. In his view, the influence of this individuation is radical, all pervasive and historical ontological. And with those words, I warmly welcome Hewitt to talk on that subject. Uh, when Michael uh, invited me to pick up this theme, I don't know what lay behind it for him but it sparked a crystallization for me. And um, that's what I've been developing um, since we first mentioned it. And uh, as with the uh, uh, colleague of mine in the Devere Society uh, suggested that there was a possibility that Jane Austen might know something about the authorship question, and I proceeded to delve into that and found that she knew about it in spades, much to my surprise. Uh, well, I discovered not quite such a definite voluntary conspiracy of hiddenness as I found in Jane Austen, but a kind of um, inadvertent hiddenness of an emergent Platonism which seems to me very powerful within both our literary and our philosophical and our historical culture in various ways. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and I have to pack in mm. um, a hell of a lot in about 40, 45 minutes. So I'll be going a bit like the clappers, as they say. Um, uh, but I'm wanting to keep it fairly short so that there's a good, good substantial time for discussion. And I'm going to start off uh, by a sidelong glance at Jack Derrida and deconstruction. Um, and that will lead me into J.L. Austin. And J.L. Austin will then lead me into a little sidelong glance at uh, Bertrand Russell and Willard Van Orman Quine and the theory of the bound variable. And uh, that will then lead me on to Peter Strawson and his more spacious views on all of this stuff, which will lead me across to the literary material. Uh, so I'm going to start uh, by epitomizing the position of Derrida about uh, conceptualization and language by reading you a poem I'm sure that you will all know. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command Tell that its sculpture well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear, 
My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, she mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. And what Derrida argues in signature event context is that words have to be able to survive the death of their author or speaker. And uh, at the same time, he's drawing out the history of a point of view which he associates with uh, the 18th century writers, uh, Robertson and um, Condiac. And uh, what he says about Condiac is this, because what is clear is that uh, there was very little doubt about the possibility of accurate reference in the 18th century. This is on page six of the translation of Derrida's uh, signature event context and later discussions of it, including a summary of uh, John R. Searle's response to it, which was published under the title of Limited Ink. Uh, a society, a uh, society, a uh, uh, li uh, uh, responsibility, limite, S A R L, which he also plays around with those initials in teasing cells in his very naughty way. Um, if I define notions such as those of Condiac as ideological, it is because against the background of a vast, powerful, and systematic philosophical tradition dominated by the prominence of the idea, eidos, idea, that's the reference to Plato in the 18th century, they delineate the field of reflection of the French ideologue, who in the wake of Condiac, this is the key passage, elaborated a theory of the sign as representation of the idea, which itself represented the object perceived. And, and there, as it were, you have the foothold of all the anxieties that Russell was struggling with in the early years of the 20th century. From that point on, communication is that which circulates a representation as an ideal content meaning, and writing is a species of this general communication, a species, a communication admitting a relative specificity within a genre. And um, what this is going to lead Derrida on to is a discussion of um, J.L. Austin and the performative and uh, the discovery of the performative. Uh, Derrida uh, not only was um, uh, highly admiring of, but it remained very significant in his ethical thinking to the end of his life. Um, with all the difficulties encountered by Austin in an analysis which is patient, open, aporetical, in constant transformation, often more fruitful in the acknowledgement of its impasses than in its positions, they do strike me as having a common root. Austin has not taken account of what in the structure of locution already entails the system of predicates I call graphematic in general and consequently blurs all the oppositions which follow, oppositions whose pertinence, purity, and rigor Austin has unsuccessfully attempted to establish. And then he quotes famously in a long argument with uh, Searle and others about this very angry dispute. 
Um, he famously quotes from uh, How to Do Things with Words by Austin the following. Secondly, as utterances are performances, this is Austin, are also heir to certain other kinds of ill. Uh, notice the hidden allusion to Hamlet through words there in, in the to be or not to be speech, which infect all utterances. And these likewise, though again, they might be brought into a more general account we are deliberately at present excluding. I mean, for example, the following, a performative utterance will, for example, be in a peculiar way, hollow or void, if said by an actor on the stage, or if introduced in a poem or spoken in soliloquy. This applies in a similar manner to any and every utterance. And then there's another oblique allusion to Shakespeare, a sea change in special circumstances, that's the tempest. Language in such circumstances is in special ways, intelligibly used not seriously, but in many ways parasitic upon its normal use ways which fall under the doctrine of the etiolations of language. All this we are excluding from consideration. And then the key sentence, a reference to ordinary in this sentence is radical. Are performative utterances felicitous or not? Incidentally, the use of felicity and felicitous, felicitousness is also drawn from Hamlet absent thee from felicity a while, says Hamlet to Horatio. All this we are excluded from consideration, our performative utterances, felicitous or not, are to be understood as issued in ordinary circumstances. And what Austin clearly means by ordinary circumstances and the exclusion of fiction is the realm of the actual, the realm of the so-called real, that something actually exists. And he is not quite denying the possibility of references to characters in works and performatives carried out in works of art and literature, but nevertheless, he's marginalizing them. And Derrida thinks that's a very classical move in the nature of these discussions. So Derrida then responds, I would therefore pose the following question. Is this general possibility of, of fail failure or failure to refer, etc., necessarily one of a failure or trap into which language may fall or lose itself as in an abyss situated outside of or in front of itself, what is the status of this parasitism? In other words, does the quality of risk admitted by Austin surround language like a kind of ditch or external place of perdition, which speech could never hope to leave, but which it can escape by remaining at home by and in itself in the shelter of its essence or telos? Or, on the contrary, is this risk rather its internal and positive condition of possibility, Kantian phrase, of course, is that outside of its inside, the very force and law of its emergence? In this last case, what would be meant by an ordinary, in quotes, ordinary language defined by this exclusion of the very law? of language. And uh, clearly what Derrida is doing there is alluding to language as a type which can be transformed in various contexts. So in my view, he and postmodernism with him in the whole issue about the uh, death of the author and the difference between the narrator 
and the writer and those kind of things that come up in modern postmodern literary criticism they are operating in the realm of platonism now i have to say this platonism is a rather bastard platonism which we were just discussing before it started jane findlay says the following jane findlay in uh, plato the written and unwritten doctrines um, which is the first of his three major works on platonism i haven't read all of this by the way i'm just dipping my toe in platonism at this point though i have long been mindful of whitehead's remark that western philosophy is a series of footnotes to plato anyway finlay says the cosmos of platonism differs as deeply from the cosmos of ordinary thought as the systematic order of some vast card index library differs from the shelf order of the volumes listed in it or from the inconceivable scattering of the items mentioned in those volumes. It is a world of notional headings, a true conceptual or logical geography, rather than a world of things as they exist or as they happen or as they are put together the, the realm of the actual and of actualism, as I would put it, to change from the normal world of cases to the ideal world of characters is, however, a difficult and painful operation, even if the association by similarity which leads to it is as natural and basic as the association by contiguity out of which ordinary world construction develops. And then he has a a spiel about how the Anglo-Saxons had difficulty with all of this, whereas those of a Mediterranean origin don't. So th that is the, that's the voice of authentic, full-blooded Platonism. I am focusing on Platonism in the sense of types. And that will take me very briefly to Russell. And in the wake of Russell, there's Quine in, uh, um, uh, uh, his book uh, 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 from a logical point of view the first essay on what there is which is well worth reading which you'll be able to find on the internet uh, but Russell in uh, 1905 was wrestling with the Platonism that he at that time subscribed to from Meinong and that is also influential with Frege, who is in the background of both the line running from Russell through empiricism, logical empiricism and on through to analytic philosophy in Britain on the one hand, and on the other hand, the line running through Husserl via Heidegger to Derrida and postmodernism and the continental philosophers on the other. And as, beginnings of a rapprochement and a bit conversation between them going on now. So um, uh, what Quine and Russell want to do is to remove denoting expressions like the present King of France. And uh, because uh, Russell thinks that if you continue to use the present King of Park, France, you are somehow positing in some platonic realm or another a, um, a mythical or ideal present king of France who doesn't actually exist. And therefore your de denotation or reference is only meaningful if that item actually does exist, which it doesn't. And uh, so he reduces that by the bound variable and the colloquial expression of this is, um, for example, when we say X was the father of Charles II, we not only assert that X had a certain relation to Charles II, but also that nothing else had this relation. Obviously the logic version of it, and I'm not very experienced in that, is more complicated than that. But there are two, there are two phrases there which together, but neither of them separately, make the reference. 
Now, I'm going to try and touch later on uh, T.S. Eliot's notion of dissociation of sensibility and the metaphysical poets. Um, well, I have to say that the tortuosity of that logical move reminds me of the metaphysical poets, because when we actually put together X had a certain relation to Charles II and nothing else had this relation, locked into that double statement is a reference. So we've already brought into view, but more invisibly, the denotation which Russell is trying to exclude. We're playing with language. In other words, he's still gripped by some sort of notion of the magical character of language, which actually conjures things into existence. Uh, right, so I'll leave Russell and Quine and uh, the uh, uh, slogan to be is to be the, um, the, the, the uh, value of a variable. And I will just touch on what Strawson has to say about this. This is in his original paper in response to Russell on referring, which I think is 1950. Um, uh, some youthful uh, bravado is in the style of this paper. This points the way to a, um, a correct answer to the puzzle to which the theory of descriptions gives a fatally incorrect answer. The important point is that the question of whether the sentence is significant or not is quite independent of the question that can be raised about a particular use of it, viz the question whether it is a genuine or a spurious use, whether it is being used to talk about something or in make-believe or as an example in philosophy. And those three possibilities which Austin doesn't properly take, an, take account of because he doesn't consider that what he's doing also violates his own rules. Um, uh, Strawson is much more comfortable and at home with. And in fact, uh, famously, of course, a lot of the arguments about this arose from uh, Anselm's ontological argument, which some of you will know about. Uh, and that is uh, the accusation against Anselm and Descartes is that they thought that existence was a predicate and that's a very naughty thing to do. Uh, because Anselm says, and I'm now leading my way to the work of art, it is one thing for an object to be in the understanding and another to understand that the object exists. When a painter first conceives of what he will afterwards perform, he has it in his understanding, but he has not yet understood it to be because he has not yet performed it. But after he has made the painting, he both has it in his understanding and he understands that it exists because he has made it. And I'll indulge myself by reading on here for your delight. Hence, even the fool is convinced, the fool who said in his heart that there is no God, that something exists in the understanding, at least, than which nothing greater can be conceived. That's Anselm's formula for the being of God. Whatever is understood exists in the understanding. And assuredly, that than which no greater can be conceived cannot exist in the understanding alone. For suppose it exists in the understanding alone, then it can be conceived to exist in reality, which is greater. Uh, we're going to the full involutions of the ontological argument and the appeal to necessary existence, but that is medieval Platonism speaking there. So the argument is bookended at one end, by, uh, uh, by that, and I'll now come to where Strawson goes in his much more comfortable way, um, which isn't as bogged down with the dangerousness of linguistic forms as um, uh, Russell's and Quine. And um, 
This is the situation in a paper which is in Freedom and Resentment um, about whether it might be. Consider the following example. I enter a room in which a discussion is going on. I hear what sounds like ordinary personal names being freely used and person predicates used in connection with them. I quickly come to the conclusion that the discussion is primarily about fictional characters. I hear the names Anna and Pierre and Emma and Julien Sorel and recognize the characteristics and incidents alluded to as belonging to the appropriate stories. Also, their speakers occasionally refer to themselves. One says she wouldn't have done what, say, Pierre did in his in his place. However, a lot of other names occur, which I can't, it seems to me, place in their appropriate stories. Tolstoy's Anna is being compared with an Anne and Tolstoy's Pierre with a Peter, whom I can't identify. At this point, I intervene and say, I know who Anna and Pierre, Emma and Julian are, but what stories do those other characters come in? And to this, I receive the unexpected reply, they don't come in any stories. Most of the people, characters we are talking about actually exist. And another example, a child asks to look at a book, usually the classical dictionary, I hand it to him saying, a good proportion of the characters listed are mythical, of course, but most of them existed or conversely. And that leads on to the next paper in that volume, which is the uh, aesthetic appraisal and the work of art. And here, uh, Strawson goes full out that the appraisal of works of art rests upon recognizing their uniqueness and their uniqueness in my sense is the uniqueness that they have as a platonic idea or type. So this is what Strawson says. It seems a clear tautology that there could not be two different works of art which were indistinguishable in all the respects relevant to their aesthetic appraisal. I respect relevant to an aesthetic appraisal. I must emphasize, I do not mean anything which has an evaluative name, but I do mean something on account of which evaluative names are applied. But there could very well be two different type arguments, type motor cars type sentences which resemble one another in all respects relevant respectively to their logical, mechanical or grammatical appraisal. To use a fashionable phrase, the criterion of identity of a work of art is the totality of features which are relevant to its aesthetic appraisal. So the work of art has not merely the qualitative uniqueness which any type logically possesses, it has a further kind of uniqueness when viewed as an object of a certain kind of appraisal, the kind which its name alludes to. Perhaps I could also express the point in this way, the only method of describing a work of art which is both entirely adequate for the purpose of aesthetic appraisal and does not use evaluative language is to say it goes like this and then reproduce it. And that, of course, is not a method of describing at all. And um, Th that goes with uh, Clienth Brooks uh, in the well wrought and, and uh, the heresy of para paraphrasability, claiming that the total work of art cannot be paraphrased. And that in turn goes with um, Leavis's concept that the works of art, or the nature of works of art, is to enact their significance. And he actually gives an example, neither he nor Harding, D.W. Harding, from whom he is quoting, um, seem to recognize how totally platonic this is, but this is what I'm claiming. 
Um, he's talking about the four quartets, uh, and he says this, the play, a creative play with the word still in the, is, is the very opposite of a game. It registers a habit of intense philosophic meditation, emotionally impelled purpose that could only be achieved creatively. Uh, for me, the word enactment is lurking behind all of this. The purpose of Bert Norton is achieved by a marvelous interplay of diverse means in the poem as a whole, some of which very much more invite the description of emotional and evocative than the passage I read. I have somewhere given my own brief characterization of the poem, but I will quote rather what D.W. Harding says about it in experience into words, quote, one could say perhaps that the poem takes the place of the ideas of regret and eternity, where in ordinary speech, we should have to use these words and hope by conversational trial and error to obviate the grosser misunderstandings. This poem is a newly created concept, equally abstract, but vastly more exact and rich in meaning, it makes no statement. It is no more about anything than love is about anything. It is a linguistic creation. And the creation of a new concept with all the assimilation and communication of experience that that involves is perhaps his greatest of linguistic achievements. And there you have what emerged, in my view, in the 20th century, the hidden Platonism of the modern theory of enactment and of the um, indeterminacy of meanings in the creation of works of art. And the history of that, which I will very, very briefly uh, go through and then come to an end, uh, is that in Shakespeare and in John Donne and uh, Andrew Marvell in particular, we have an extraordinary self-consciousness and capacity for the creation of individuals, which um, uh, Harold Bloom called Shakespeare's invention of the human. We think of people like uh, um, uh, Baroon, uh, Hamlet himself, Ulysses, uh, the uh, soliloquies of Richard II and of Henry IV in Henry IV Part II, and many other characters in Shakespeare. They're extraordinary introspective and highly individuated characters. Now, in the background of that, uh, if I can find it, uh, we have uh, Samuel Johnson, who basically says that the characters in Shakespeare are types. And um, in the process of that, he has embraced the whole model of representation that um, uh, um, Condiac, uh, as I've quoted by Derrida, was evoking. And, in, and as a bonus, you get a complete thoroughgoing mimetic theory of the understanding of the work of art. And that mimetic theory dominates criticism right up to and including, and there's some in the 20th century as well, A.C. Bradley in his um, uh, work on the uh, criticism of Shakespeare, Shakespearean tragedy. And this is what Johnson says. This is absolutely classic from that kind of terrain. Nothing can please many and please long, but just representations of general nature. Particular manners can be known to few and therefore few only can judge how nearly they are copied. The irregular combinations of fanciful invention may delight a while by that novelty of which the common satiety of life sends us all in quest, that the pleasures of sudden wonder are soon exhausted and the mind can only repose on the stability of truth. Shakespeare is above all writers, at least above all modern writers, the poet of nature, the poet who holds up to his readers a faithful mirror 
He doesn't include the as twer that Shakespeare himself includes in Hamlet, as twer a mirror, a faithful mirror of manners and of life. His characters are not modified by the customs of particular places, unpracticed by the rest of the world, by the peculiarities of studies or professions, which can operate but upon small numbers, or by the accidents of transient factions or temporary opinions, they are the genuine progeny of common humanity, such as the world will always supply and observation will always find. His persons act and speak by the influence of those general passions and principles by which all minds are agitated and the whole system of life is continued in motion. And then the key sentence, in the writings of all other poets, a character is too often an individual. In those of Shakespeare, it is commonly a species. And of course, as we know, and as Levis constantly points out, the rebellion against that comes through William Blake in particular in the late part of the 18th century uh, to, to generalize is to be an idiot. In minute particulars alone is uh, beauty to be found. I can't remember the precise quotation, but that movement towards individuality, uh, difference and so on, which is associated with the romantic period, and which we undoubtedly find in the most concentrated poetry of Coleridge, Blake, um, Wordsworth, and Keats in particular, and later in the century, a uniquely and quite extraordinarily, without a single uh, publication to his name in the work and writing of Jared Manley Hopkins, uh, which all passes us on to the opening of the doors again that Eliot gives us with the concept of the dissociation of sensibility where he connects up the possibility of modern poetic writing with um, that of the metaphysical poets in the background of which the Elizabethan dramatists particularly Shakespeare are in the background and um, the, the nature of that, those works is nevertheless, although individual, completely and radically individual, and in this I agree, it does not follow from their being individual that they are not ideal. They are platonic types. And uh, what was happening in the 19th century was that alongside a criticism which was thoroughgoingly mimetic unless it was art for art's sake, in Oscar Wilde and Pater, um, there was a, a, a major creative impulse, Jane Austen, Charles Dickens, George Eliot, the Brontes, um, Henry James, Joseph Conrad, onto D.H. Lawrence, what uh, Levis calls the great tradition, but we can certainly include Virginia Woolf and other 20th century writers in that, the masterpiece of Virginia Woolf. Um, Mrs. Dalloway undoubtedly needs to be included in that, um, uh, that um, canon. Um, and um, then we find that the whole theory of postmodernism, without its being named as such, is based on uh, manipulations of concepts and thinking about the radical dis the, the indeterminacy of concepts conducted on platonic lines. And along with the development of the understanding of um, individuality in literature and indeed in other contexts, the, uh, it's a life work of Jung to think in terms of individuation and uh, Freud's work uh, moves away from um, um, uh, uh, cerebral cortical science to understanding the processes of psychotherapy in terms of the case story and his paradigms become literature in the form of Oedipus Tyrannos and Hamlet. 
And uh, those developments are going on in parallel. Of course, there's a long war going on with positivism and empiricism. And, uh, but at the same time, hidden there, there's another river flowing, which is the Platonic River, um, which is organized much more powerfully in the things we have to deal with than um, uh, I think, as far as I can tell, uh, anyone has yet dreamt. And I'm going to stop there so that we can have a talk about all this. What well, wonderful. Thank, thanks so much for such a, a rich uh, uh, survey. At such a breakneck speed. Yeah, of, of, of such a large la landscape, really, with so many interesting trees and so forth. Could, could, could you... Um, you know, in, in, in maybe two sentences, give it, or three, give a very rough um, sort of map of, you know, of, of the main points, your uh, main features of the landscape you've looked at, or, or the, say three points you think all of us should have taken in from what you've just said. I, so I think a lot of people will, myself included, will have been quite overawed by the number of references and, uh, uh, complexity of, of the material presented? Uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> fundamentally trying to give a historical account of the evolution of consciousness through literature in particular, but alongside of it philosophy as well, into from, from a position which is, reaches its culmination in the 18th century based upon representation, truth, reason, nature, uh, a sense of organization of the world on rational lines. And um, by, at the end of the 18th century, and perhaps Boswell's own life of Johnson is a transitional case because it's the first modern biography effectively. Um, we have a transformation into a focus on the individual. And what I am arguing that that focus on the individual becomes the paradigm which is more and more indirectly explored in the 19th century and gradually emerges into explicit exploration at the end of the century and in the first half of the 20th century. And that is a movement towards the individual. But what my argument is that that is still on a typological basis and mm -hmm. which we even see in the dreadful uh, document of American psychiatry, the DSM, um, because that's all in terms of types. Um, yeah. But we will pass that by. Mm. But in terms of literature, the, uh, the greatness of a work like Emma is because when it, we consider it a complete work of art is because it conforms to an interlaced typology and the nature of the work of art is uh, reproduced endlessly. Now, of course, we know situations where there's more than one mm -hmm. version of a work of art. D.H. Lawrence produced them all the time, for example, um, three versions of Lady Chatterley, two versions of The Plume Certain, God knows how many of, of the sisters and women in love, um, and so on. And we have Beethoven producing uh, four versions of a, an overture to Fidelio, uh, particularly num Leonora number two and number three are very similar to one another. But nevertheless, in each case, we can say we know the type of this. And what happens is not that there is a loss of Platonism, but rather the Platonism implicit in the process of individuation and historical consciousness becomes constantly richer and more elaborate until none of us can encompass it in our own thinking. So I'm saying that because, because of the confusion between actuality, actualism, and individuality, people assume that if something is quote unquote a particular, mm -hmm. uh, in stress of individuals, yeah. therefore an entity yeah. Yeah. out there which is actual. I'm suggesting that the fundamental nature of individuality that we're dealing with is more like a template or a type or an archetype mm -hmm. or whatever, and that that's what we find in, in Bleak House, 
in Nostromo, mm. in Mrs. Dalloway, and so on. So mm. that far from Platonism being in a process of dying, it's in a process of resurrection. Mm. Wonderful. Yes, yeah, thank, thanks very much, Stuart. That, that, that was uh, uh, very, 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 very helpful. Um, do, you, do you think it's, it's one of the values of works of art, I suppose, um, in relation to human beings, um, the, the, the novel in particular, that, that if it's successful, it allows us to come to a better understanding of types that, that actually exist and have got some objective validity. Um, well, it depends what you mean by objective validity. Yeah, well, something that is, is, um, is, is, is beyond one's own um yeah what well, one's own power to reject or accept it's something that actually exists in it in a transcendent way uh i i think that there's a, a diversity of experience which is portrayed in the greatest art which um is attuned to or does mirror what we experience in our existence and in fact uh, one of the insights of postmodernism is that we ourselves are all works of fiction because we're operating according to typologies that we have received from one source or another. And uh, there's very little that is actually fully original about any of us. But if you like, our individuality consists in the ensemble of all the things we are rather than it's consisting in some unique template which as it were applies only to us so there are many variations and possibilities but the nature of the beast is so complex that the idea that we can reduce it to typologies in the uh, template kind of sense programs if you like ai programs um is um very much of a stretch at the present time it may be possible and as we well know there are works of art such as asimov's work which explore the possibility of whether robots can acquire uh, a sense of identity and individuality in their own right having been programmed by human programmers and uh, whilst that uh, presupposes a level of computer development, which we have now far surpassed um, about 30 years after Asimov's death, nevertheless, they're very thought provoking works as such. So I think it might be possible in one way or another that um, individual identity can, be, uh, can emerge from artificial intelligence. Um, but in that case, we would be dealing with it as individuation in the same way that we deal with our own. Um, lots of topics there. I'm, I'm sure people have got uh, questions or points points to 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 raise. Prudence, you you look as your, your face is pregnant with questions. <laughs> well, um, well, yes, hidden hidden Platonism in the particularity of the modern age. <laughs> But um, I'm, you, you uh, refer to Jung as well, and psychology, of course. And I've always been puzzled by the, the confident way in which psychologists and psychotherapists talk about the psyche, the mind. Um, and Jung, of course, thought what we call the, the psyche is our experience of what um, is observed in a third person way by observers outside. So it would be just a subjective experience of something that could be in theory objectively explained. But, but I think most, most Jungians and, and others go on beyond that and they speak as if the psyche, subpersonalities, complexes, whatever, are things in themselves. Uh, things, yes. Mm, so you have inflationism there. Um. The, uh, the, the, as you're well aware, in the traditions of philosophy, there's a long mm -hmm. argument um, about whether uh, pr private sense data are, so to say, 
uh, mm. parasitic derivatives of uh, the physical world and our experience of the physical world on the one hand, mm -hmm. versus those who think that the physical world is a, um, a logical construction out of uh, actual and possible sense data, though I have to point out that actual and possible sense data is a platonic notion, of course. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> Could we say that perhaps the human the human mind is a Platonizing mind? Maybe we are we are primates who create yeah. abstract categories by nature. Yeah, I think that that's a very profound thought, mm -hmm. and as it were, that we platonically self create. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. um, certainly uh, that well known uh, Platonist of uh, temporality, uh, George uh, William Friedrich Hegel would have agreed with you on that one. We do precisely oh. gradually uh, create ourselves through self-reflective processes and differentiation and reintegration and so mm. on and so forth. Yeah. So um, for me, it doesn't much matter whether, I, mean, I, mean, I think that, I think there's danger in over reification of quote unquote, the psyche um, uh, conscious experience, mm. private experience, mm. a public world, being in the world, and so on and so forth. Mm. All of but, that. Yeah, but, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking almost more of the structure of the psyche. Um, do we have an animus, an anima, ego, id, etc., etc., etc.? Though those are quasi things. I mean, Quine and his disciples, Davidson and so on, postulated that our languages, which use nouns a tremendous amount, are pushing us towards this abstractification. Um, and Nietzsche, you could have other languages might do it differently. And Nietzsche anticipated that, of course. We, mm. we shall not be rid of God until we are rid of grammar. Yes. Uh, Absolutely, yes, yes. <laughs> and, and so on. Yes, yes. And um, yes, I think there's, uh, there's a lot in that. Um, I'm not sure whether we should be rid of grammar or God. They both seem very useful <laughs> things to me, but sorry, you're sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm just trying to make the historical point. Um, uh, I mean, Quine himself, of course, has it both ways. He says, well, well, as it were, on Tuesdays, I believe in a physical world, and on Wednesdays, I believe in sense data. Mm -hmm. and we, can, <laughs> we, we can play the field on that. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I think that um, the point I wanted to come round to, which takes us into postmodernism, is that all of the Jungian concepts are metaphors. Yes. And what we are, what we are doing is we're metaphorizing are psyches or whatever we choose to call them. And um, I don't know whether you've come across the work of Julian Jaynes, J-A-Y-N-E-S, mm -hmm. The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral. Oh, it, yes, yes. Um, and basically what Jaynes argues is that uh, when we cease to organize our experience on the basis of sustained hallucination of the gods, we had to construct our, ourselves using metaphors of one kind or another. And that's, that's how it, so for example, um, Zeus is noos. When mm -hmm. Zeus has uh, something in his noos, mm -hmm. it just means he, he's, he's got his eye on it. <laughs> uh, when yes. Noos comes out in Plato and in Aristotle, mm. it now means a broad metaphoric vision of experience, and it's mm -hmm. being used profoundly as a metaphor. And when mm. we say, uh, my heart bleeds for you, we're in that same territory. Mm. My, heart, my heart bleeds for, the, for Ukraine, or uh, whatever mm. we want to say. Oh, uh, uh, this yeah. was such a fantastic uh, uh, sunset. I was I was breathless with wonder. 
Mm. Now, we might mean I was literally breathless, but we also mean that breathless is a metaphor for wonderment. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, uh, it seems to me that uh, as a fairly skeptical psychotherapist, that um, uh, pretty well all of psychotherapy is founded on metaphor. But then I, mm. I also mm. believe that the whole of our communications is founded on founded on metaphor. <laughs> but all the extreme um, uh, biologists would would say, well, metaphor can, uh, our emotions in fact originate in bodily feelings. Our, our old cortex experiences astonishment as breathlessness. Yes, and, exactly. and somehow we moderns can separate our awareness of that from the physical feeling. The Kleinians would take the same line, of course. Yes. Um, and Reich. And, and so I, I, I think I think there is a meaning of meaning, um, which is uh, itself meaning, but there's no primary meaning. No primary meaning of meaning. There are just transformations of meaning. Mm -hmm. And transformation, of course, is itself a metaphor until we go on. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Thank you. I will log off for, for this question. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah. Any, any anyone else would like to um, you know ask a question or, or um, before I sort of ask people? Um, oh, Ma Michael. Now there are two pe two Michaels here. So I don't know uh, whether which of you has got. <laughs> Michael York's waving his finger. I think it's yeah, my, Michael. Uh, pointing at you. Alpha, Alpha oh, you're pointing at me. Oh, yeah. I see. No, I didn't have a question. Not really. <laughs> I'm sure you you will have a comment, Michael. Can't you? You know, come on. Uh, but this is you're talking to me now. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I, this is somewhat out of my field, so I have to express myself more modestly, probably than I usually do, and, and probably in a somewhat dimmer way. Um, yeah, I had one sort of question or, or, or comment, um, which may seem very foolish. Is there a conflict between individuation and ideals, Platonic ideals? Or have I rightly understood that individuation is only the variation of a template, in which case you're arguing uh, here that everything in R is based on a kind of Platonism, even when it's very individualistic. Oh, I don't know if that's a very yeah, good question. I think that's a really good, good, good question, Michael. Is it, is it? Oh, well, thank you very much. You're very kind. I, I, this is a little bit out of my field. No, I think that that's actually correct, and that's what I'm saying. And I think that that is uh, because of because of the preoccupation of postmodernism, and I would have to say also uh, the analytic tradition with being anti-metaphysical and uh, anti-ontological, and not, not wanting to uh, okay. dip their um, toes in that toxic lake. Um, they haven't realized the extent to which they themselves are monumentally metaphysical and Platonistic. And I, th I, think, we, I think we do live in a, a Platonic universe. I don't think that there's the kind of conflict that Findlay and maybe Plato himself postulates between the actual and the essential. I think they're monumentally entangled and the whole nature of modern literature is precisely that they are massively massively entangled and we can't think outside of this mm. that's where kantianism has got us mm. Not the I, sorry sorry Taylor. um my, my michael um uh, do you, would you agree with that i mean or, or are you someone that would uh, that would not be willing to uh assent to the proposition that the the world is essentially platonic uh, I, I would no no i was actually talking uh, oh, yeah, to the yeah, other so, michael but yeah, i mean okay. you can certainly are uh, <laughs> my short answer is is yes so then over to the other one yeah i because I, I know for you matter is 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 it has a sort of primacy yes so i mean it was a wonderful talk uh it's totally uh, flummoxed me because I mean you go into everything 
Um, and I'm just wondering, how would you understand Aristotle vis-a-vis -vis art being metaphor and um, the type being, I guess, the reality as opposed to the instant? Mm -hmm. Good question. Well, um, uh, Findlay argues that Aristotle um, didn't fully understand Plato, although he gives the best account of the doctrines, Aristotle thinks that they're rather foolish, whereas, of course, Findlay thinks that they're very sensible. Um, Nevertheless, Aristotle works, as does Kant, and indeed as does Wittgenstein, with aporias. He works with puzzles, and he seeks to resolve the question of being by differentiating between the accidental aspects of uh, existence or, or Dasein um, and the um, th that which appertains to being as a a full complement of identity so to speak so um, uh, Uzia substance is um, I mean, I'm not an expert on Aristotle by any means, but I picked up one or two things along the way. Uzia is uh, an expression of identity as a whole, if you like, the categories of existence, which are, I mean, Strawson calls them persons and things, individuals, in his very Aristotelian work. Um, and they are, they are category differences. Now, I have no objection to that, um, but I think that um, Aristotle and Kant, and I would hazard actually Wittgenstein as well, are operating to make category differentiations. And if you're operating to make category differentiations about the nature of existence, Heidegger is also playing this game on a big scale. Um, you're dealing with um, types. In other words, you're in the Platonic realm. In other words, it's not an either or. That would be my thought. Uh, Prudence, are you going to say something here? I, I wasn't volunteering to say something, but, but um, I, I do agree. I remember thinking this about Aristotle years ago, that, that he is busy, busily making categories, the categories, and, and yet he's always contrasted with Plato. He's, in fact, Aristotle, of course, is much more of a forerunner of linguistic philosophy and, and abstract grammar, for heaven's sake, than, um, than Plato ever was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, yes, I, I utterly agree. Thank you. Yeah. And interestingly enough, of course, uh, uh, Aristotle has a much more favorable view of works of art than Plato has. Ah. <laughs> Although, um, of course, the Platonic dialogues are nearly all of them themselves works. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful works of art. What, what's Aristotle's view of the function of art then? Catharsis. It's, oh, yeah. yeah. Hmm. We, we, we are... We are dramatic art, yeah, dramatic art. I mean, yeah. uh, sculptures aren't necessarily so cathartic, are they? It's basically, it's basically therapeutic. We're healed yeah. by experiencing vicariously pity and terror. And that releases, that, that enables us to unfreeze the shock that is within us. I mean, he doesn't put it that way, but nevertheless, that in his concept of catharsis, which literally means an enema, as you probably know, um, it's about releasing emotions so that uh, we will um, um, uh, experience what Wells Wordsworth calls rec um, uh, recollection um, in tra tranquility. I can't remember the exact phrase. 
So um, it seems a very limited view of, of the function of art. Most of the things which I value most highly in art, I wouldn't describe as cathartic in their effects. Uh, it, it, it's something quite different, really. But um, well, uh, that begs the question: What is it? Um, I, it, I, it, it it's a sight of some superior beauty that that radiates something that that one receives as a blessing. I suppose. It, well, that, that's thoroughly platonic, of course. Yes, it may well, <laughs> may well be, but it, yeah, it, it's not. It's not seeing art as, as a catharsis, as some kind of uh, uh, substitute for uh, uh, an enema. I mean, that that, that really. Uh, mm. uh, um, oh, Neil, would you like to you know, ask a question or make a comment? Uh, everyone's got to got to contribute here. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to thank you Ed, for that uh, wonderful magic carpet right yeah yeah nice, nice. yeah nice. fabulous thank you yeah um um daniel uh, any any You're point, on mute, daniel. yeah any any uh point that uh perhaps you'd like to ask uh Hayward to clarify or a question you have or uh, a comment uh at this point, uh, um, no. <laughs> I'm. I have. Um, I'm. I have a very great lack of um, um, of grounding uh, about philosophy. I have not much knowledge uh, about Plato and uh, Aristoteles and Socrates. Um, it's very difficult for me to follow. But a great incentive, I thought Hewitt's yeah. talk was, is, is done in such a way that one feels one wants to. I mean, I wouldn't normally think, gosh, I've got to read Strawson. I really wouldn't. Sorry, you know. <laughs> but Hewson's talk sort of says, well, maybe I would. You know, so I think, I don't know. Maybe you felt that too, Daniel. I don't know. I certainly felt that a little, I think. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, e Edith, Edith, uh, I don't know where, whether the absence of your uh image means you've retreated to the kitchen or, or something but would you would you like you, you always make a you always don't want to say anything but when you do it's it, it's usually very a very good comment would, would, would you, any question or point you'd like to, to to make well yes it's just my personal you know be in my bonnet um which i suppose has arisen through individuation as, as I understand it, but I, I don't really understand it. I've only just learned the word actually. And I didn't understand anything Harold said really. <laughs> but what concerns me, and I did see some overlap, is that increasingly we live in a very virtual world. We experience the world virtually. Yeah, that's very good. And that's yeah. that sort of accelerating almost exponentially. Absolutely. Um, and I just wonder, because, you know, um, of course, I love art, uh, I love music, I love literature. Um, um, but I wonder if, if it has the um, um, experiencing the real world virtually hasn't gone a little bit too far. And, um, and I, I was struck by something you said about there's a sort of watershed moment at the end of the 17th century or was it the end of the 18th century anyway where, when the age of enlightenment sort of broke in on Shakespeare and you know all those people and and you we started um um and sort of and it was uh, and we started looking at the world in a very different way and we've just carried on down that track and I I just sometimes I feel that we there's a general feeling amongst um uh you know ordinary mortals perhaps mm. but i do detect it that it's we're it's too far it's all too vicarious you know whether you're highbrow you know you go to the opera or you're lowbrow you've got your selfies and your facebook kind of thing but mm. or all of it um and of course this is what fascinates me about michael in cologne is that occasionally he used to drag us back to minute observation of the natural world, mm, mm. Um, which seems to have really, mm. I mean, people sort of, I, I don't know, I can't, it's, it's all, I'm a bit confused, but I feel that it may be, um, oh, 
it's it's gone a bit, a bit too far um, with the virtual stuff with mm. art because modern art now just everybody just looks at it and thinks well a lot of people look at it and think what does that mean you know how's that helping me and modern literature modern plays increasingly they don't ring a bell and people are turning back you know um to older stuff even quite lowbrow older stuff because it has more well, i don't know anyway i've got confused now but anyway that's mm. that's all i can say i'm i'm for fighting at one level, a rearguard action on behalf of, um, if you like, a canonical conception of art. And it is assumed that postmodernism is opposed to that, and it's a deconstruction of canons. And um, uh, bye bye, Daniel. Um, Yes, thank you. Connecting with art that in a real way, bringing his girlfriend to a concert. So, um, in in recognizing that, however rich, there is a value of a canonical way of thinking about traditions. Then, whilst that is virtual in the sense that you mean. It's not virtual in the sense that I can go on Facebook and I can see a hundred pictures of people's cats, as it were, uh, or the lunch that they had at the restaurant or whatever it might be, because the, 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 what's happening through AI is a, a massive and monumental trivialization of experience which of course Nietzsche anticipated and didn't like at all and thought that we all had to become Ubermensch uh, or Uberwinch. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> I remember that, Hugh, that's very good. Uberwinch. <laughs> it's been I Uberwinch. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, he, he was, definitely onto something and a lot of what the 20th century was about and uh, Levis was this in spades was about tr uh, uh, these fragments I have shored against my ruins as T.S. Eliot puts it in the wasteland that actually everything is falling apart as Yeats puts it and um, that we are getting uh, a uh, we're moving more and more into epochs of banality, and that's Hannah Arendt, of course. Um, and I do not know the answer, but what I do know is that whilst simultaneously people are more interested in history than they ever were before, as John Lukacs points out in Historical Consciousness, which is a major work I recommend anyone, um, at the same time, the official arenas of discourse are now discounting history and indeed have simply forgotten it. People do not have a historical sense anymore. Education, the, what's been done to education in the West has destroyed historical consciousness on a massive scale. And I don't know how we get around that. But as far as I'm concerned, I would like to put in place as strong bulwarks which people can get hold of. And uh, this seems to me one of them that actually we recognize that we've got two and a half thousand years heritage and we actually use it to um, uh, explore a virtual kind of experience to be sure but one which is not banal trivial and about you know the size of your teapot or whatever it might be. I, I think it would be nice to have that as a, as a clip to to sort of introduce the whole concept of Salteria, this 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 group. Do you not think so, Michael? That, that... Oh, yeah, I, I strongly agree. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I strongly agree. Yeah. Um, Mick, good to see you. You probably didn't 
rhyme in time to hear most of the the, the, the talk. I I don't know. Um, yeah. No, I, I missed all of it, mate. I, I, oh dear. I don't right. know about this, trying to close the National Brewing Centre down in Burton on Trent. So uh, <laughs> I just come back from that demonstration to uh, voice my disapproval of. Oh, oh right, that. you weren't trying to drink it dry or something. <laughs> <then>. <laughs> No, um, oh, well, good to you. Good, 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 good to have you here anyway. Um, um, what, know, uh, sorry. Yeah, no, I was just going to throw in a small point to what Hewitt so admirably expressed. Uh, I entirely agree with him. I think it relates a little bit to some of the things I said about at the last sort of meeting about crime fiction, that you have a genre and you relate to different works of art within that genre. And if you don't have the sensory experience, if you like the direct experience of the cultural milieu that is appropriate for that genre, for example, if you have no knowledge of Paris or of the French language, then I think that the Maigret stories are, are too abstract, too distant from one's own experience. So what I'm saying is that I think these works of art refer to um, points of reference that come from one's sensory experience and therefore one has an understanding and an apprehension and enjoyment of them and when work of art or if it can even be called art is created which intentionally willfully or even unintentionally produces experience that nobody has that direct sensuous connection with and that it is necessarily meaningless and uh, that takes us back, I think, to this platonic idea that there are these underlying universals um, that I would understand it in that way, on which one references oneself. Mm. Um, that, that, that makes sense, something like that, yeah. 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 But, we, but we've sort of been trained to see universals. We, we tend to, to look for the commonalities and the things. I mean, I, I was wondering about asking you, Hewitt, if, if a non-Platonic mind would be the Homeric mind, people who act on impulse, to whom thoughts happen, thoughts occur, they find themselves doing things rather than thinking things out. I mean, th this was the, the, the Jane's idea, yeah. I, I think. But, but he has been criticized, of course. I, I haven't kept up with that debate but uh, you don't hear it spoken of very um mm. very reverently nowadays sorry um who are you talking about because uh, 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 the, the bicameral mind uh, oh, man yes julian james julian james yeah um i'm thinking about what what would a non-platonic mind be like if we're all ineluctably looking for categories and types uh, and so on um the world as described by Homer, Jane's was proposing, is one that, that is entirely particular and impulse driven and, and paleocortical in a sense. Well, for me, that wouldn't mm. not be platonic. Exactly, non platonic, yes. No, it wouldn't not be platonic. Oh, all right. Double negative. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because I'm not, I haven't got the platonic assumption that all of this is connected with goodness and excellence and so on. That uh, It seems to me the typologies also include um, more primal forms of experience and also include experience of evil. And that uh, um, we... The, the kind of platonic universe is a, a very subtle kind, but nevertheless a perfectionistic um, understanding. I don't share that, mm. but that doesn't stop me thinking that we can think in terms of types and um, uh, various kinds of type ways of thinking about experience and structures and so on. Mm. Um, so it's a, that's why I said at the outset it's a bastard place of Platonism. It wouldn't be seen, what we have today would not be seen by Plato as uh, com complying with his understanding of experience because of mm. the monumental ethical drive that there is in his, his thinking. Um, uh, whereas 
watch. Um, I, I, I agree that Homer is paleo, what did you say? Paleo Paleocortical. <laughs> Paleocortical. <laughs> yes. Non-reflective on the whole. There, there's, a, there's a very lot in that. Whereas, of course, the interesting thing uh, is that reflection has entered when we get to the Odyssey. And, right. Yes, right. and indeed, Odysseus is precisely um, singled out for that characteristic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It was obviously not not widespread. Exactly, and mm. um, uh, James takes that as being indicative of the major transition that is going on. Of the breakdown of the bicameral mind. Yeah. 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 The emergence of the, the. I mean, in Jamesian terms. Consciousness, which we're all inhabiting at this moment in time, mm -hmm. is a form of hallucination. Mm -hmm. James doesn't spell that out, but it's implicit in the latter part of his book uh -huh. because he, he basically says that the study of science too has uh, bicameral origins and that therefore we're mm -hmm. all grip mm -hmm. on um, some kind of hallucinatory framing of experience. Hmm. We, we've just introduced a reflective loop into it. Mm -hmm. he, he, doesn't, he doesn't nail that down, but I think it's a very natural inference for, from his, his work. Mm -hmm. And um, whilst I think that there are all sorts of things we can argue about, James, nevertheless, I think it sheds a flood of light on certain individuals, Blake, for example. Blake was simultaneously mm -hmm. a bicameral person and a modern reflective person. Uh, Joan of Arc was a bicameral person, has always interested those in, who are interested in the bicameral mind but absolutely a superb military commander as well. Uh -huh. And of course, um, both Nietzsche and Jung were thoroughgoingly bicameral and yet also highly reflective. And so it goes on. Um, so uh, I, I think that um, the, the apple doesn't fall very hard, far from the tree, Prudence, as they say. <laughs> You're not likely to find the purely bicameral person. No, we're not going to do that, but we will find a lot of transitional people, arguably both Jesus and um, the Buddha were transitional in that sense because they both had uh, in-depth encounters with a devil figure. Mm. And um, uh, they also... Uh, uh, created uh, traditions which place a very high value on the visionary process, both of them. Yes, oh, um, yes, fascinating, yes. Um, All right, can I, let me just bring in, uh, apart from the bicameral thing, which, I, which is fascinating, and I know it's been kind of dismissed uh, over the years, but anyhow, I think it's, there's, there's something still to consider there, but ultimately is not the question or the debate, whichever way you want to phrase it, between whether these universals are pre-existent or is the universal something that we are creating one way or the other or developing towards. So this goes back to the Aristotle-Plato divide again, as, as I see it. I think we're continuous, continuously creating, but there are also templates. I mean, the, the classic one is uh, language. Um, uh, if Chomsky is even half right, there's a m massive genetic component in our possession of language. But that doesn't mean to say I genetically inherited English or that um, uh, someone else genetically inherited German or Swahili or whatever it might be, because the, the capacity to learn a specific language, 
and there are no other languages than specific languages, not even Esperanto is a non-specific language, um, is uh, part and parcel of that genetic heritage. I don't see an either or. Or, with, or this template of language, I mean, is that a, a pre-existing universal? Um, I think it, I, I, would, I would go with Jung rather than Freud on this. Freud was a full-blooded transmission of experience person. Little people, and people uh -huh. don't do this very much. He believed in archetypes as much as Jung, but he kept quieter about it. Um, uh -huh. But what Jung says is that there are potentials for archetypal possibilities. And I, whilst ever there was a, a huge disagreement at some level between the Jungians and Levi Strauss, the structuralist thinking about these processes, um, if anything is made clear by mythologique, it is that there's endless variety in the creation of myth. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean to say there are not some features which are fairly uh, prevailing and uh, um, repeatable, but they're also transformable. I mean, we only had to look at Shakespeare and Wagner to look at the transformation of me. So I, I think it's both. I, again, music, think of music. That's why I was going to bring up music because you're talking about the specificality of language and yet is not music something that transcends specific language and so people can communicate through music even though they have different language bases? Well, I think that music is just as specific in its the form it takes as language is, but um, uh, Ian McGilchrist and um, mm. uh, Suzanne Langer, are both of the view that the template for the emergence of language was created by music and music is much earlier in the species mm -hmm. than, than language. But both of them would, as it were, imply that we have a quasi-platonic dimension to our existence, but we also have a, an endless capacity to transform it, which is the historical mm -hmm. sense, which is, um, uh, we simultaneously today live in an epoch where there's more historical transformation going on than ever before, and simultaneously most of us are unaware of it. Mm. But historicity is alive and well in the culture. Now historicity, uh, the capacity for historicity may be inherited, but clearly it's a, a temporarily, temporally evolving process and therefore it's partly empirical or partly factual. How is history empirical? Uh, because uh, it's determined by events in part, it's determined by contingencies. But then it still is that those events are interpreted. As soon as you get into the interpretation then you don't have uh, the empirical ability to uh, test it. It sounds absolutely, I would absolutely agree with that. There can't be a there can't be a control study of history, certainly not. Mm -hmm. But um, and I I absolutely agree with you. I mean, Nietzsche said there are no facts, only interpretations, and uh, that's the territory we're in. But I would say there are facts, and we constantly reinterpret them. The facts, too, are iterable in Derrida's language, but iterability is a platonic notion. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Edith. Oh, it's, uh, oh, Edith, you're waving goodbye, are you? Oh, would... I wanted to say something. Oh, sorry. great. Oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please, please. please. Oh, I, sorry, I missed a bit, but um, um, talking about language, it just popped into my head that um, the people say that... Um, even uneducated people have lost thousands and thousands of words from their vocabulary, which describe the world as it is, mostly animals and plants, and which describe physical things. 
and um, we've all lost thousands and thousands of words. I mean, they've made lists of the words we've lost and are no, no longer used, but you find that 500 years ago, they were in use and they've been replaced by uh, other words, mm -hmm. um, but they don't, <laughs> they don't describe, you know, things, you know, plants, animals, th or things that you touch. So I just thought um, mm -hmm. that, <laughs> I, I just think it's a great loss. And mm -hmm. I don't think, um, you know, I don't think even highbrow art, or I think especially highbrow art, mm -hmm is perpetuating that divorce from um, the real world that was familiar to everybody and you could see it in the language. And I'm sure you could find the same with any world language is that they, you had thousands of words mm. or, you know, I mean, Arabs have about hundred words for dates and about 200 for camel, you know, all the different types mm. of camel that you can get and the different types of date. And they've all, they're all fallen into disuse and you've now got, meeting, conference, um, individuation, you know. It, to me, it's not progress. I'm sorry. Well, so my, I, okay, good point, good point. My guess is uh, there's actually as powerful a creation of new words, a new slang, a new jargon, and so forth, hmm. as there is loss. Yes. I agree with you about the losses and what we're talking about. Um, and... and um, in many ways, Levis was one of the most nostalgic thinkers uh, of the century. Um, um, the, the wheelwrights shop and all that kind of stuff. The um, the 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 sturt, the sturt kind of process, and the um, appeal to Dickens in particular, because mm -hmm. uh, more and more as he grew older, as uh, someone who embo embodies the old ways of observing and thinking and so on and so forth. Um, but I think he underestimated the degree to which transformation is continuing to go on in language. And um, I, I, I suspect as yet that a, a major author um, that who doesn't yet exist could actually produce it, could actually uh, give us it, though in what form, form it would take, I do not know. I mean, I think there's, a, I agree that with you, there's a massive amount of, uh, let's be blunt, dumbing down of uh, uh, linguistic resources and so on going on. But I don't think it's all that. And I think there are uh, myriad subcultures some of which are delusional, but a lot of which are actually focused on particular realms of experience, which are actually quite powerful and diverse. And I don't think we're, I think the, those of us nostalgically inclined are inclined to dismiss all that. But of course, in 30 years time, we would be looking back at what we have today with some kind of nostalgia, just as now we look back at the 50s. But I don't think it's just nostalgia because, for instance, my laptop, it's full of little, little things, you know, if I opened it, it's full of little, little things. They all have names, but most, they're not common parlance, all the names, all the, the things, the tools, the, the, the things, um, they're not, they're, they're not sort of common knowledge, they're expert knowledge. Mm. But, but that I am divorced, I don't know, I don't know what half the stuff's called, you know. So anyway, I don't think it's nostalgia. I think it's actually um, what we've become divorced from the names of the things that make our world go round, literally. We, we, they don't have names. I mean, they do have names, but we don't know what they are. I, I think that's a very important point that we've lost uh, a lot of the vocabulary of the sensory world and the, the world of nature. Um, and tools. And I, and I think tools. that's an important, and, and, and tools yeah, as I mean, well, Derek. <laughs> If Instead, you read the screw fix catalogue, it's absolutely mind yeah, Well, we rely on the on the vocabulary of uh, technology and experts who hand down their abbreviations, but it hasn't come from the experience of ourselves from our everyday lives. I completely agree with that. And uh, yeah, with the experience of nature, it is really I I used to think I was about average, 
with my knowledge of the names of plants and birds, but I very rapidly discovered, and it's with no pleasure, that I'm a, a sort of a, unusually knowledgeable compared to other people, which is mm. a shocking state of affairs because I yeah. should be normal. I should be about average and I'm not. Yeah. Mm. Um, my cousin admitted to me that he could not identify a single bird except perhaps a blackbird. It is all astonishing that we've reached that stage of affairs. And people yeah. can't identify trees, they can't identify insects. You know, they, a fly is just a fly, although there are literally hundreds of thousands of different species of fly. A fly is just a fly. And I think it's getting worse. I, I would absolutely agree with that aspect of the You're an old-fashioned Englishman, Michael. I mean, because it, it was a very English thing to, mm. to know all the trees and all the mm. flowers mm. And, and everything. But, yeah, there, there was that element, wasn't there? The sort of the collectors of the 19th but century. The but younger the, generation, they're not, they're not there at all. I have to be going, folks. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, some, of, some of us read your comment. Yes, goodbye. Thank you so much. That was yeah, very, yeah, very that, interesting. That, they, I mean, you, you, you very, very much you. Would indeed. Yes, you, 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 you must have put a lot of work <laughs> into preparing the yeah. book. It was so, so richly referenced. So thanks very much for that. Uh, I think we're all appreciative of, of the care uh, and dedication you've given to, to the delivering the talk today. So, so thanks very much. We've, we've really enjoyed it. Um, Thank you very much for all of you uh, being so appreciative. Uh, I, I thought I would be um, probably burnt at the stake, really. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, you would, I'm glad that you've you've twice encountered very uh, sympathetic and appreciative reactions yeah, to your talks. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I, it's, hope, it's, I hope we're not terribly suggestible, though. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, anything but that. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Hewitt. It was really it was really fascinating talk. Yes, and uh, thanks for everyone for contributing uh, with such, such just good comments and questions and. Uh, yeah, and I, 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 we have to obviously bring things to an end, but I, I think, yeah, there's enough energy to, to go on. Um, is this a recording, Michael, are you? Yes, yes, it's being recorded. Yes, that is recording, yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. So, and just a short note, in a month's time, we'll be having a Sotoria meeting, hopefully on a very different subject, uh, which is Danish literature, Danish writers. Um, so, but you'll be hearing about All right, then. <laughs> Okay. Well, he'll, he'll, right. he'll, 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 okay. Goodbye. Goodbye. Yeah, thanks. Goodbye, everyone. Lovely to yes. see everyone. Bye bye. 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 bye.